Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this sunny afternoon here in Geneva. Very happy to have you with us. And I'm really grateful today to um, welcome and to have with us uh, Bomsori Kim, violinist. And we're even more grateful to see her uh, here today because he's, she's virtually just come off the plane in Bangkok, Thailand, where it must be incredibly hot. Bomsori, welcome and how are you? Hi, Florian, so great to see you. I'm great and just came here. Uh, it's so hot here, but it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like you just come off a plane. <laughs> but it's you you were in Korea before, right? It's not the it's not around. Yeah, it's not that yeah. long. It's only five and fifteen minutes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. I think you should rather be out on the street uh, and look for some glorious Thai food, or um, would you rather be practicing the Beethoven violin concerto, which you're about to play, I don't know, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, is it? Yes. Um today because it's rainy here so maybe i will just stay and practice because beethoven concerto is i played last time like more than 10 years ago so i really have to be ready for that wow that would be a challenge mm -hmm. well let's start um and talk a little bit about competitions or um rather what they meant to you what they were for you you said in in a previous interview on your um, Deutsche Grammophon album, Violin on Stage, that in this album and with the repertoire, um, with the different pieces, the different composers in that album, you wanted to share your story. Um, mm -hmm. So today I would also like to hear a little bit your story and especially your story um, in respect to music competitions. You've uh, won in a lot of them, we could, we could almost call you a, a competition tourist, so to, so to speak, you went to so many. Uh, you won in Sendai, in Hannover, in Munich, in Moscow, in Montreal, and, and last, I think, in uh, Poznan, in Poland. So yeah. when, you, when you think about all these competitions, what comes to mind first? Stress. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I I have to say that it was a stress, stressful time, but also um, I learned so much from competition. And um, the reason why I, I'm now performing all around the world is because I was ready through the competition. Um, all the stressful process and uh, preparation for the repertoire, lots of repertoire. Um, in such a short time, short rehearsals with the orchestra and conductor and other musicians and all the experiences I had in competitions actually are really helpful for me now, actually. Wow, but in, in the end, I mean, you did so many of them, you, you say mm -hmm. it was really stressful, but you still got the energy and the willpower and, mm -hmm. and, um, and really put it together every single time again was it because you wanted to or because your teacher told you or because you felt it, it you were really profiting from it mm. um first of all i wanted to perform outside of korea so that's why i participated in uh, international competitions the first one was sendai and um actually i was not expecting to get any any prizes from there because it was my very first one and I had no experiences before you, that. At, at the time you were still living in Korea? Yeah, I was okay. I was studying in Korea in Seoul National University and the Sendai competition was in 2010. So I was still studying with my teacher in Korea and uh, that was my first experiences out, out of Korea. Um, and Actually, the Sendai competition is very, very special because it's um, it requires us to play only concertos. So from the first round to the last round, we had to we had to prepare more than four or five concertos. 
So that was a really challenging thing for, for me and for everybody else. But it was also, that's why it was so helpful for me because I had not so many experiences with orchestra, but I was able to communicate with orchestra. I was able to learn communication skills from that competition and also the rehearsal skill and everything else. So um, after that competition, I was so sure that the competition is really helpful for my musical experiences and, and it will be helpful for my future, future performance. It sounds so um, not, not easy, but kind of going from Korea to Japan is not very far, um, but then Sendai is really one of the one of the biggest violin competitions. Really, uh, they're actually happening this year, and they have a really illustrious uh, jury with mm -hmm. Gideon Kramer and many other uh, big violinists there. So for you, it was also uh, kind of from zero to one hundred in in one step. No, it wasn't a small, uh, easy uh, repertoire, no, small but, competition mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And then from from there from then on um, after that you went to study in the United States or you stayed still in Korea? Um, I I was in Korea for for four more years actually after that because I I wanted to um, study with my teacher in Korea Young Kim uh, more so I went to the graduate school in Korea. Um, and I did more competitions actually right after Sendai and in that year in 2010, I went to Sibelius competition. And after that, like many more competitions until 2014. So after that, I went to study in abroad in States at Juilliard and yeah. <laughs> Right. Do you think Koreans are especially um, made for, for competitions? I asked um, Nam Yoon Kim about this, actually, because mm -hmm. so many of her students go to, to international yeah. competitions. And she said, well, maybe um, they are more disciplined than others or they have better control than others. Um, is that true? Do you think you are in any way different from, from mm -hmm. others? What, what makes you confident in a competition? What makes you feel like you have, you have control? Um, particularly Koreans, they, they are generally, I mean, all the Korean music students, I see them hardworking people. So that's why we have more, um, more people in the competition and more people get the prizes. Um, but also, in, historically, Korean loves music, and um, from very old time, it's written that we we have a lot of interests in music and dance and like artistic. Um, um, how can I say artistic things uh, culturally? So maybe that's why people in Korea they love music, so that there are more people winning something, I guess. But this is not, um, it, this hasn't been always the same, no? I think <laughs> recently it has increased a lot, um, yeah. but it, it wasn't it's always teachers. like that. Yeah, teachers, they are more, I mean, before, long time ago, um, there were not so many people who, I mean, not so many teachers who studied abroad, mm -hmm. but now, there are so many great teachers in Korea. So even in even people in Korea, they say that there's no need to go abroad to study music, classical music. That's very which true. I so, <laughs> which I don't agree, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a different subject, but um, it's it's very very true uh, that this internet internationalization is kind of. Um, getting to the limit because even in Korea, you can find foreigners teaching now and foreign students now. And so uh, it's, yeah, the, the geographical distance um, is, is only one parameter. The other thing is, is 
that you can very well go to Europe as a Korean, you can go to Europe and study with another Korean in Europe or um, <laughs> yeah, the other way around. And indeed, yeah. you, you told me you just came back from Korea teaching as well, right? Mm -hmm. I just had a master class in Korea. I taught three students and they were wonderful. Yeah, very talented and like really passionate about music. And yeah, they were very fast, understood my comments. And yeah, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. Great, great to hear. Let's get back to competitions a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any any special memories, any experiences that you would like to share? Like if I just throw in the ring the ARD competition, which maybe was one of one of the really, really big ones that you did. You won, uh, I think, second prize. There was no first prize. Correct me if I'm wrong. In, two, in 2013, uh, that happens quite a lot um, in, in, in Munich that they don't give a first prize because the jury cannot agree on, on a candidate, but it's, it's an incredible achievement to, to really become the top um, laureate in that competition. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember uh, yeah, some I remember experiences it. back from 2013? Yes, uh, because the ARD competition is my dream, dream competition because of the orchestra. It's my dream orchestra, the, the Bayerisch Arundfum Orchestra. And um, that's why I brought Brahms concerto, concerto um, the German, very German uh, repertoire with the very German orchestra. So, um, so after I got into the final, I was so excited. I didn't really think that it's a competition. I thought it's a great, a great opportunity to play with them because it's so early in my musical career and it, there is no way that I can play with that orchestra. <laughs> in, in, I mean, if, if there's no competition like that. So I was so excited and um, because the introduction is so long, the Brahms concerto, and I really, I am able to really like see that vividly that how they how beautifully they played the oboe oboist from the orchestra he played beautiful solo from the beginning and i just fell like fell in love with that music more even more from the competition i mean not only for for the last performance but also from the rehearsal i was like dreaming all the time through through that process yeah, that's wonderful to hear. It's my hometown, so I, I'm, I'm especially uh -huh. I'm especially happy to hear that. I love but, <laughs> but I wonder if you have, as a violinist, if you have to do the Brahms concerto, especially in mm -hmm. in uh, a competition like this, and you listen to I don't know how long it is, ten minutes or even more of introduction. What is in your head? I mean, you're not only dreaming about the oboe. You're, you're also nervous. <laughs> it's not that long, actually. It's, it's one or two minutes. <laughs> no, but actually, the second movement, I mean, I heard that, um, I, I think it's Joseph Joachim or, no, it's Chrysler or Joseph Joachim. He complained that uh, the first, uh, I mean, the second movement introduction is too long and all the beautiful melodies are <laughs> for woodwinds, not the violin. So he complained about it to Brahms, but I mean, I have no no complaint actually. I enjoyed so much. <laughs> I'm thankful that I, I can hear in the very best place to hear that music, like 3D <laughs> situation. So yeah, but I can say that in that particular moment in 2013 in the competition, I really enjoyed the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no regret or anything about that. Yeah. So when you go on stage, you're not really, really nervous before this, or like, as, as I wonder, yeah, you listen to this long, to this beautiful mm -hmm. introduction, but you know that in the next moment, uh, you have to be 150% uh, mm -hmm. 
tech, everything has to be there. So how, how does that work? How do you prepare for that? So there is a, a certain moment that I have to focus. I mean, I have to start to focus on my playing and because the beginning is the most important and beginning should be great, greatest actually to give good impression to people. But yeah, so there is, I, I said always from this bar, I have to be ready for, for, for like holding violin or something. So I, I'm actually calculating all the things so that that's why I can actually enjoy it. <laughs> mm. You calculate that means there's some routine going on in uh, uh -huh. in your head while while they play. I rehearse that a lot in my preparation with uh -huh. with piano because I cannot always rehearse with the orchestra. That's interesting. And then if mm -hmm. something happens and if the beginning is not as great as you want it to be. Um, how do you recover? How do you sort of regain and then? That's actually really difficult, not easy to recover after ruining the first part. <laughs> but, but I mean, the piece is long, the, the music is long and people don't, I mean, for the performers, it's really difficult to get over it right after ruining something. But actually, when you think of the perspective of audiences, they they are listening to what is happening now. So we have to really like forget it right away. I mean, but it's not easy, I know, but we always have to try. I always do that. So, but well, actually um, it's interesting that I sometimes get even more interesting performances after some mistakes or after bringing some parts because I then I really forget everything else and I don't get afraid of making any mistakes or something after after having done something like that so it can be more like energetic and more risk risk-taking performances yeah it, sometimes it turned out to be a better, better one. Is there a particular one that you remember or that no. you would rather not remember? <laughs> that, 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 I mean, I maybe I forgot everything. I forget everything. Like, I don't want to like remember every really moment. So maybe I, I don't remember that. But um, yeah, I mean, I always try to do that. And there's, I, I don't remember anything so bad <laughs> so far. But it's it's true that um, if something mm. happens in a performance, it can also be some outside thing, or it can be um, mm. uh, particular circumstances, or it can be like you jump in for somebody else at the last minute. Um, oh. These performances can be especially good because of that um, yeah. high energy or, or high, or yeah, something is. Things like that, yeah. Hmm. Because I I went I had one experience as breaking strings, <laughs> and I didn't have any spare E string, <laughs> so I asked to some audiences if there is anybody who has the E string. <laughs> but this is not in the competition. No. In no. a concert. Uh. Yeah, in a concert. <laughs> yeah, luckily. Um. So, so at that time I asked to my pianist to fill in the, the moment that I have to change the string. So it turned out to be a great performance it's because the pianist played some great things and, and people loved it. And people loves actually when performers, they break strings. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's a great effect. A um, little bit back to competitions. We were in 2013. Um, at the Munich competition. Now you did a few more after that. And, and I think your last one was the Anjavski, right? Yeah. How did you come to choose that competition? Because that really in, influenced your career a lot, didn't it? I really didn't want to participate in it, <laughs> really. Um, especially the Vinyaski because they require us really like certain specific pieces written by Vinyaskis. 
and I have no confidence on <laughs> playing Vinyavsky piece because I always thought that I'm not the player for the Vinyavsky because he was such a great violinist and I I had a certain idea about his music and turned out to be it was wrong because um, I thought he was really like really advanced player. I mean, the best players at that time. And that's why he wrote all the all kinds of technical um, technical things in his music. And as m I thought he put as much as possible or something like that to show off his skill, but it was actually not true. It was always well planned and well written for the violin and well, um, actually it was, the purpose was only about music actually for him and to make it really interesting for, for the listeners and for the violinists. It's actually really fun to play his music. I didn't know before I study before before participating in Kamtinyavsky competition. So I'm very glad that I chose to do that. And I am proud that I didn't, I mean, I was not so scared to to try something that I don't I don't feel very comfortable, very comfortable or convenient or yeah or yeah very convenient or something like that so how long before did you did you start preparing that particular repertoire uh, the, the question i'm asking is um you know there is maybe 80 90 percent of competitions they all have the standard repertoire there is beethoven there is brahms there's tchaikovsky maybe uh, Bruch, maybe uh, um but then there are others um, in, obviously in Helsinki, you have to play Sibelius. Um, in Tongyong, you don't have to play Isang Yun. In Munich, actually the last violin competition, um, they did not have Beethoven or Brahms or Tchaikovsky on, in the final round, but they had three modern pieces among them, like the Hindemith Concerto. So you would really have to, most people, I assume, would have to learn that concerto for this particular competition. And I think that's a very interesting aspect. Uh, if if you do something completely different that, you know, mm -hmm. that is not being offered anywhere else. So I don't know how much that would be, would have been the case in, in Poznan. In Poznan, uh, I would say about three, four months. Because mm -hmm. they asked us to play uh, Vinyavsky, one of the Vinyavsky concerto in the final and they asked us to play Vinyavsky pieces in first and second round so there were quite many Vinyavsky pieces we had to learn and also there was a pre-screening before the competition and in that in that pre-screening we had to play Vinyavsky caprice and also some Bach or Paganini for Maxim Wengerhoff so, but you had, you, you could do the, um, the concerto you had already in your repertoire. You had to learn it only for the competition. No, <laughs> <laughs> I had, to, I had to learn that. Uh, but I mean, the, the second concerto I learned when I was very young, only the first movement, but I had to learn totally. Yeah. Again. Wow. So, and, and then after this competition, or what had it already been happening before? Was this really a, a major milestone for you? I think it was, no? You, you really, your career took off and you started uh, traveling all around the world after this. Yeah, uh, because I, I met my manager and also I met my very close musical partner, Rafa Blahaj and I mean, my manager, Gregor Kotov, he was the comment, I mean, he was the person who made, who made the comments uh, for the TV. And I, what I loved about this competition, the Vinyaski competition was that they really, I mean, 
in Poland, it's like a national festival, like Chopin competition. So it's they are broadcasting everything in prime time and in live in prime time for their major TV channel. So everybody is aware of this competition and everybody is really like passionate about it. So the atmosphere was really, really hot. And like so many people couldn't get the tickets for the competition. So from the first round, from the from the first round to the last round and the gala concerts were like totally sold out. So that experience was really amazing for me. And that's why it, this competition was very powerful because this Rafał uh, pianist, Rafał Blechacz, he was also in Poland living there still. And he was watching TV and following the competition from the first round. So that's how he discovered me. And, and my manager was commenting there and he, <laughs> He, I didn't know because they were speaking Polish. So, but he he told me that he was supporting me from the beginning of the competition, and I was really grateful for that. And after that, we made such a great uh, relationship together. And he, I mean, the company company helped me a lot mm. um, to, yeah, to get many, many performances outside of Poland and Europe and in the States and everywhere. That's wonderful. You know, it, it's actually, if, if it happens that way, that you win a competition and you get hired off the stage, so to speak, um, it, mm -hmm. it's an ideal uh, situation mm -hmm. for the artist. And especially if the chemistry is right and if you have the feeling they are really interested in your, in your personality as, as an artist, mm -hmm. Um, I've worked in several uh, or with several uh, many many agencies, small ones, big ones, and mm -hmm. it's wonderful to have smaller agents that really concentrate on the artist, mm -hmm. where you really have the feeling that they take care of you and personally and and worry about you, and you're not um, one of a hundred in in a huge roster of of other people. Mm -hmm. So, so that is really a, a, a great opportunity, I think, for, for a competition after you win this competition to, to go with an agent. And then um, to find a duo partner, of course, of that standing is, is another uh, really uh, great achievement. Just for, for our listeners, I know that the WFMC, we have um, a conference coming up in Bitkos, which is the hometown of oh. Rafael Blechas. Have you ever been there? Of course. You have been? He still lives near there. So is we it live. a nice place? Can you tell us anything about it? It is Any very... restaurant recommendations? <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. But back to back to Poland. Um, you said that uh, you feel you feel very much at home in Poland. And maybe audience is one of the factors for that is do you think Poland and Korea have something in common in that way because Korean audiences are also very enthusiastic and very warm no yeah um totally I think it's because also we share some of the historical background that we were I mean in Korea we are in between like China and Japan we were always in in a very difficult challenging um yeah, time we had so so much. I mean, so so much hard time with them, and also in Poland as well. So we share some of the emotions, I guess, in this historical background, and maybe that's why I feel very um, connected with them, and they they love my my musical style, I guess, and um, they are very romantic very passionate I mean they are really like helplessly romantic I guess <laughs> <laughs> and I mean you can you can say when you hear Chopin or Vinyaski or Shimanovsky you can hear the, the special feeling that they have I mean it's not like any other composers I guess and in Korea as well I mean they they're they are 
really enthusiastic and and romantic, I guess too. <laughs> but but the good thing is, in Korean audiences are young, and also I I see that in Poland there are so many young audiences, even like little ones. They want to come to concerts, and they they even I mean. <laughs> Younger ones, they want to come to rehearsals to hear the the process of making music. So I felt I thought that it's so wonderful um, experiences for them and also education. That that's why they are building such a great uh, audiences, um, even in younger generations. Is that the same? I mean, have have you played in in smaller towns in in Poland as well? Like for yeah. really local audiences, or is all, it different there? All the province, <laughs> yeah. All I the went province. all the cities <laughs> in Poland, and yeah, I mean, pro yeah, provincial parts as well. They they really are passionate about music, and I mean, even their airports are under <laughs> musicians' name, Chopin Airport or Vinyaski Airport, and I really feel that musicians are loved in Poland. Mm -hmm. And that is the same in Korea as well, right? Did you did you tour with Rafal in Korea as well? Yes, we did um, in 2018, 19, 18. Yeah, we we had a tour with uh, in Korea after we released our new album for Deutsche Grammophon, and we had great time. Yeah, with Korean audiences, they really love rap pop. I have so much from, I guess from two thousand five. He won Chopin when he won competition. When when he won the Chopin competition, there were two Korean people who won third prize without second prize, and they are, they were like idols for for Korean people. And of course, rap pop is one of them. And he was the winner so so people really were excited to have us because it's such a special combination because they think it's quite identical that uh miss kyung ha chung and zimmerman christian zimmerman they played together and they made a, a recording um for deutsche Grammophon for like like so many years ago, 20 years, yes, I don't that know. that would have been a, a few months. Yeah, yeah, so many years ago. It's a really great, great album. And they feel that this Korean-Polish combination is so special. And yeah, that's why they were so excited and they all came to our concerts and really supported us. That's wonderful. And, mm -hmm. and Rafael also enjoyed it in, in Korea. Rafa wants to come back to Korea so bad. <laughs> Beautiful. That's great. Maybe um, we're almost at the end. Maybe just um, a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the past two years. What um, has COVID done to your life, to your career, to your uh, style of working? Now that we are at the end of the pandemic, um, what stays with you? I, I know that you're very, very active. On social media, you have I don't know 50, 57,000 people following you, which is um, a, a great number for a classical artist, and and it certainly helps you to to bring in audience to concerts wherever you go. Um, I also want to know why you have another Instagram account called Bomsori Airlines, but that's a <laughs> it's a different question. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, these past two years, what you have done and, and mm. what this past stays with you from the, from the pandemic mm -hmm. now? I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was very difficult for me as well because every, every concerts were cancelled and we hadn't, I mean, we couldn't move even <laughs> to outside. I, I live in Berlin and we really couldn't meet anybody in Berlin at that, yeah, in, in the peak of the pandemic. And uh, I was very lucky to have, uh, have had the very first concert in Korea, I mean, after announcement of the pandemic. 
it was in 2020 May. And I had a concert with KBS Orchestra for it. It was a charity concert for the, the Doctors Without Borders. And um, I, I played Mendelssohn Concerto and I had a, a break uh, because of pandemic for about like four months or no, three months because I played until the very end of, I mean, the line. I played until March, 2020. I had a tour with, a Spanish tour with Rafael. So it was like right, we, right after we finished our, our tour, the, the Spain, I mean, Spain, they closed their border. So it was really like <laughs> very, can I say, very challenging time for us to like to travel even with mm. that situation but after that I came back to Korea to stay with my family and with two two month of break and then had concerts with audience I mean of course with mask and with the social distance but it was such a great great and very special moment for me after that because we were very unsure and we were worried so much about our musical, I mean, our life as a musician that if it's even possible to live like this because we had no concerts and nothing to do. But after two months and then suddenly I had this first concert and I felt so impressed and so touched by the fact that I was able to do that in Korea because at that time Korea was better than in Europe or in states that it was the better so much better con condition that's why they did this and after that I like, everything actually turned out to be I mean it was very difficult also in Korea but but I was grateful that I I had that concert and then after that, I also had this very special concert for Rhine Music Festival that they had virtual concerts and they filmed everything and they broadcast through Magenta 360. And we had really interesting projects together with, with Rhine Gang Music Festival. And also, also in the middle of pandemic, I was able to make this recording of my first album for Deutsche Grammophon, my solo solo album with Polish orchestra in December 2020. Yeah, and um, it was such a miraculous moment that we were able to do that because it was delayed like so many times. First, like the conductor or the orchestra members, they got got infected and then it was delayed. And then in some other days, it was um, the engineers, sound engineers, they got, got infected. And then <laughs> <laughs> so everything was so unsure. And so, I don't know, it, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. But do you think now you did a lot of um, virtual concerts uh, I mean, you recorded a lot during this time. Um, what do you think is going to stay with us in the future? Is it going to go back to what we what we had before, or is has the world really changed? And and this mm -hmm. online, this virtual, this streaming element will stay with us a lot more now. I think um, this virtual thing is they will stay with us because it's. I mean, will stay with us, but I think it will be both because we need live audiences. And as a performer, it's totally different story. If there is audience or it's without audience, it's totally different story and totally different performances is coming out from us. So we really need the live audience. But the good thing is that now everybody or every um, orchestra has this live streaming system. So people who cannot travel 
so far from Korea to Europe, it's not so easy now to come because because of the situation, everything is changing for the travel restrictions. And but they can still watch that. Um, even with the live audience, we do the live streaming, and it's it's a good thing. I I believe that it's a good thing that they also live stream, even though we have the live audience. And in the, during the pandemic, um, were you able to sort of feel like you keep in touch with your audience through the social media, or did you feel yeah, like I, totally cut off? I was trying to to not lose the connection with the audience because. I don't want to, I mean, we need these audiences um, after we get back to our new normal life. So I didn't want to lose the connection with them. That's why I was active, more active actually than before Yeah, on social media. And I appreciate that because my YouTube channel, uh, I, I didn't have, so much so many followers then back then but now i have so many more followers even more than my instagram so um they really wanted to i think it it grew up so much during this pandemic because people wants to come people want to come to concert but there's no concerts they they can actually go so they want to really um um feel this thing through this YouTube uh, platform. And yeah, I, I am very glad, grateful that they actually tried to, to connect with musicians through this kind of platform. And to, I mean, it's the reason why we are performing actually that they want to hear us. Yes, it's very, it's, it's very, good to have everyone back on stage and, in, and we now feel the importance of these live performances uh, yeah. so much more than before. So in a way that maybe that is a positive effect of these really tough two years. But I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, you have your Beethoven concerto coming up, another important live performance in Bangkok uh, the day after tomorrow. And you should definitely go out and have some Uh, green curry now after a hard day it's been really wonderful talking to you and to see you Thank so you. We, we wish you all the best and i hope to see you sometime soon thank you so much dear Florian. thank you Bomsori. thank you everyone for listening we'll stay in touch and see you sometime soon thank you very